I wanted to, to start by telling you a joke. Just a little joke. When I first walked out my first Live at the Apollo gig, um, televised, the biggest TV show that I had done at the time, and my first joke was, my name's Shapi Sandy. I'm a female Iranian stand-up comedian. They call me the box ticker. A simple joke, and it breaks the ice, made people laugh, and then we all moved on. Now, that joke about being a box ticker, like any joke, it made people laugh because it's true, and it resonated. And all my career, I've had people saying, oh, you got on live at the Apollo because you're a woman and because you're Iranian. Well, I can tell you that my mother has never got on live at the Apollo. Um, one of the things that somebody like me, who isn't um, typical, I would say, in the world of show business, has to contend with is people attributing my successes to doors being opened magically because I'm not white or because I'm a, I'm a woman. And... Oh, well, no one wants to um, ever uh, feel that their their skin colour or their gender or their sexual orientation is the thing that people attribute their success to and not their grit and their effort and their talent. Because without those things, you don't get anywhere. No one ever says, you know what, we're just going to give her a chance because she's got um, olivey honey. Well, I'm quite tanned, but whatever. Now... I think about diversity, not something which allows people like myself a bit of the space. Um, diversity for me is making people like myself, people who are different from the norm, um, ordinary. I want to feel ordinary. I want to feel that it's not of note. And I want to feel that way and yet also draw from my own experiences, my own background, without it being a hook that I've hung myself from. So to give you an example, when I first started out in stand-up comedy, I was um, I was about 24 when the BBC noticed me and they said, give us a script. And I wrote a script about being a life model because I was a life model for, for a long time before stand-up paid the rent. And it was me going to, you know, this is a script. And it came back with one note Thank you very much. Uh, we enjoyed your script, but we we really would rather see um, some work which draws on your Iranian background. So very, at the very start of my career, I was told, could you be more brown, please? We've got the normal people for the other normal staff, but if you could be the brown one, that would really help us immensely. So... What that does to, to, to you when, you when you're in an industry that you really want to thrive in, it, it puts you in a box and you're ambitious. I was ambitious and I was, un I was indirectly told that I'm much, much, much more likely to get a commission if I do the Iranian stuff. And so I did. And then I was put in a box and I ticked that box. I don't know how much has changed. Diversity has been, in my business, certainly painfully slow. And it's so important to change that. I went in to talk to the BBC about it recently. And I said, look, look at all of the non-white comedians that you have commissioned on Radio 4. All of them talk about their ethnic background or their political. So you have done to them what you've done to me. You have expressed to them that that is what they are there for. And that is the death of creativity. And we are losing a lot of talent by treating people that way. Why does it happen? Well, it's not because anyone is a terrible person or a racist or anything like that. Unconscious bias is something that we should be able to talk about in any industry that we are in. It, it is, it's a human thing that we, we build tribes, you know, we promote people or give jobs to people who we feel comfortable with, who we share a common ground with. And often those are people who are like us. And that's what's got to change. It's not necessarily the workforce or the, or in my case, the comedians, they're already diverse. Everyone wants to get into show business. So many, um, non-white, different, uh, comedians want to, want to start. But the gatekeepers, um, they're, they're, they're not very diverse. 
so then your otherness becomes of note. The problem with this is that it stifles creativity and in any workplace we have to accept that diversity means properly stepping out of your comfort zone and seeing people for more than um, the differences between you both. Like in a workplace, if we make a real effort to get diverse people in, get people who are different to ourselves, what happens? Well, one of the things that can happen is that we don't feel as comfortable and that's okay. It's okay to not feel comfortable. One of the things that can happen in that situation is that the more diverse workforce might not get our jokes. Humour in any workplace, any place where human beings have to work with each other is critical because often that's how we connect with each other. If so Morph was the first Asian that I saw on mainstream television. Um, oh, I love that little plasticine guy, but I wish things that had been different. I, I wish that um, there were more trailblazers. And so when I turned up on the scene, I would have been more ordinary to people and I wouldn't have been talking to a TV producer discussing my role in a big TV programme. And and he said, I know, we'll get you in a belly dancing outfit and have you dancing out of an Alibaba basket. The programme wasn't about Alibaba, but he looked at me, saw Middle Eastern, belly dancer, we'll get a basket. I pulled out of that show, I lost the job. I don't want that to be me. Um, that's just one example in my industry uh, and it is getting better but slowly and crucially we need to address this issue of unconscious bias. It's not something to be afraid of, it's an uncomfortable conversation but we need to have it. Um, and then I'll, I'll um, maybe I'll find someone to, to pitch my idea for a sitcom about being a life model. I mean it's really good, I've got it here in this desk. Thank you. Thank you.